Good afternoon, welcome, and Happy New Year. Um, today is the inaugural Thinking Differently Unexpected Conversations presentation. Uh, my name is Nick LaRusso, and I'm the medical director of the Center for Innovation. As many of you are aware, the Center for Innovation is organized around platforms, uh, strategic opportunity areas. And one of our platforms is the platform of the culture and competency of innovation. And it's devoted to educating and accelerating the pace of innovation around Mayo. We have a number of components of that, but today um, we're launching um, our fourth year, third or fourth year of the Thinking Differently speaker series. Um, we began it in 2009 and we created it uh, with the objective of establishing a dialogue between individuals at Mayo and people from all over the world with different kinds of perspectives about uh, innovation. Um, obviously, we're interested in learning from these experts. Uh, we expect them to introduce new perspectives to all of our thinking. And then over the day and a half or two days that the guest is here, they have a number of conversations with individuals um, from the institution beyond the Center for Innovation. And, and as many of you know, we've had the privilege of um, having a number of outstanding speakers. Tim Brown, the CEO of IDEO, the world's foremost design company, um, spoke. He was the first speaker. He's the author of the book, Change by Design. We had Sarah Miller Caldecott, the grandniece of Thomas Edison, and the author of the book, uh, Innovate Like Edison Speak. David Kelly, who was the founder of IDEO, as well as the founder of the D School uh, at Stanford, came. And most recently, in the last quarter of last year, we had General Hugh Shelton, the former chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who talked about leadership um, and authored a book called Without Hesitation. And we've already lined up some outstanding individuals for 2013. We have Michael Crow, who's the president of Arizona State University, coming in March and uh, Dr. Mark Smith, who is the CEO of the California Health Foundation, coming in May. And we'll have probably two more um, the second half of the year. But today, we're particularly privileged to kick off 2013 with a really special individual, uh, Mr. Dave Gray. Uh, Dave works with senior leaders from all different types of organizations to help them design more flexible in and innovative organizations. And, and his approach is to help them visualize complex challenges uh, with the objective of making them understand those challenges, see them um, uh, better so that they can solve them and move their organizations forward. And he, he's worked with leading organizations around the country. He's authored two books. His first book, Game Storming, uh, is essentially a practical handbook for innovators and change agents. And his Second book, which just came out recently, The Connected uh, Company, is a strategic blueprint print or roadmap uh, for businesses that would like to innovate and lead in the 21st century, which is the main reason we have uh, Dave here. So his talk today, The Connected Company, is going to focus on what's uh, happening in the public environment and its effects on organizations with a particular emphasis on the relevance of these issues to healthcare in general and Mayo Clinic in particular. At the conclusion of his presentation, as we've done in the past, Barb Spurrier, my administrative partner, will engage Dave in a, in a conversation using both questions that some of you have already submitted and questions that we will take from the audience. And Dave will remain uh, uh, after the conclusion of this till about 1.30 to meet with individuals one-on-one. -on -one. So please join me in giving a New Year Mayo welcome to Mr. Dave Gray. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, the title of my talk, uh, which we uh, designed before I knew what the talk was actually going to be, is The Connected Company. 
So, but I think if I were going to title it now, I would say what it's really about, what I really want to talk to you today about, is how to make a complex system more adaptive. And I think we can, I think we can probably all agree that healthcare is a complex system. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, you also have a changing environment right now. So there's, there's new regulation in the form of Obamacare, uh, which is really going to change the healthcare landscape in ways that probably a lot of us cannot even begin to predict. Uh, there are new technologies, biotech, genomics, nanotech, robotics, aging population, telemedicine, and you could probably name 100 more that I'm not even aware of. Uh, but I think in conversations this morning, it was confirmed to me that the kinds of changes that are going on in healthcare today uh, are actually going to be more challenging and more difficult than probably we've had in the last 50 to 100 years or so. Uh, the money's running out, basically, right? The well is running dry. Uh, so what else? I think complexity. So this is something that you have to deal with probably at a, at a scale that very few organizations have to deal with. Complexity of regulation, complexity of um, just the actual operating stuff that you do every day. So if we can agree that healthcare is a complex system that needs to evolve, and I think when we put these two things together, that's what I'm here to talk to you about. How can you do that? Uh, raise your hand if you've heard this term before, complex adaptive system. Good, good quite a few. Uh, those who don't, we'll talk about it a bit today. A complex adaptive system is something that's found in nature. It's all over the place. Um, every organization is, in some, to some degree, a complex adaptive system. It's a complex system that evolves. Natural systems do this. So what are some components? There has to be variation. So there has to be a, a large number of diverse agents that have autonomy, that can basically make their own decisions about how they operate within the system. This is basic evolution, right? Variation, selection. Uh, there has to be selection criteria, so an environment with limited resources. And, you know, the resources are becoming more limited in the healthcare environment. Uh, I think it's about, uh, uh, Dr. I was talking to Dr. Wood this morning about the percentage of uh, the average person's income that goes toward healthcare right now is like 25 to 30 percent. And that's probably not going to be able to go up anymore. Probably going to have to go down. Um, and the third thing is interaction. So in a complex adaptive system, these autonomous agents within this environment have to be interacting with each other. So some examples. Um, oh, okay. So self-organization is the key. So a complex adaptive system evolves because it can self-organize. Because these independent autonomous agents, which might be anything from Physicians to ducks, right, and geese have to interact with the environment and with each other, and that's how the system evolves. Examples, ant colony, a human brain, cells in the brain, the uh, traffic. You think about cars and how we all get to work every day and when, how traffic jams come about and how things flow. Uh, terrorist networks, uh, Facebook, Amazon Marketplace. These are all examples of self-organizing systems filled with autonomous agents interacting and making these decisions all the time. So variation, selection, interaction. Now, what's inter where this starts to become interesting for me is these are all things that you can tweak. These are all things that you can actually have an effect on. You can't control a complex adaptive system. It's, it's not a hierarchy. You can't control it in the way that you typically think of controlling in an organization. But you can influence it. And by being smart about how you think about it, how you actually, you know, move these levers, you can actually have some tremendously interesting impact. Fitness is a term that you're familiar with in healthcare, right? It's important. Fitness of a human being, but also fitness of an organization, also fitness of an entire system. So how fit is the healthcare system in our country today? We have a lot of debate about that in the Congress, right? So there's something uh, called a fitness landscape, which is a way of visualizing uh, fitness across a landscape. So um, think of the um, think of the overall you can have the think of the overall fitness of a system or the fitness of any individual agent within the system as being the the health and adaptiveness of that being, right? And what you have to do to become fit in an evolutionary sense is you have to make trade-offs. 
they'll see, they'll tell you what I mean. So there's a trade-off that you have to make between being agile and being efficient. For example, hummingbirds have made a lot of trade-offs to make them extremely agile and able to move around, right? Hummingbird has to be very small. It has, it has to operate almost on like basically just sugar, right? The albatross is something that is optimized for efficiency. There are lots of trade-offs involved. In fact, even the trade-offs that are involved in becoming a flying organism, you can't have big, strong bones and fly. You have to actually have very lightweight bones, which means they're going to be brittle. And, the, and you've got to have wings, and you've got to have certain things if you're going to be a flying organism. You have to make trade-offs. So there's no such thing as, you know, you can be the strongest, the biggest, and also you get to fly. It's not going to happen. Right? You think about um, in the, the mechanical world, the world of engineering, we have the similar kinds of trade-offs. The trade-offs that you have to make to be a jet fighter. I mean, a jet fighter actually trades, now that they have computers these days and built into to jet fighters, uh, a jet fighter without the computers will not even be able to fly. <laughs> it's actually constantly rebalancing itself so it can have that agility and be able to turn really fast and so forth. Whereas the jumbo jet, optimized for efficiency, kind of like the albatross. Making sense? Now, we're making trade-offs in our organizations all the time. Now, for every trade-off that we make that makes us more efficient, to some degree, makes us less flexible. Because we're actually trying to control things and making everything work consistently, predictably, and so forth. Right? So in this fitness landscape, the way that you evolve is you make adaptive moves so these are, these are the trade-offs that you make. Well, we're going to have a committee to do this because we want to do this better, whatever that is, right? Well, that committee is going to optimize the whole organization for X, Y, and Z, but it's also at a cost. It's also always going to come at a cost, and that cost is probably agility. Okay. Now, the first efforts when you're trying to move up that adaptive landscape, when you're relatively low, right, on the you're down here in the valley, and you're relatively low, what happens the first adaptive moves are going to look kind of clumsy, right? They're not going to be perfect the first time. But those first clumsy efforts are necessary because the later advances are going to build on top of them. So without the Wright brothers, you know, kind of throwing this thing off a hill, we might not have a jet fighter today. These things have to actually evolve. So what's easier than pointing to an innovative effort and saying, that's clumsy, that's ridiculous, and that's a failure. That means innovation is stupid. That's pretty, actually pretty easy to do in a large organization, right? But you have to have the, um, the vision to be able to see that this is a flying machine. That has not been done before. Of course it's a clumsy effort. Of course it's not perfect because it's a flying machine. I don't know why flight is my theme today. Uh, but I have some healthcare stuff, don't worry, coming up. So you, you, you move, making these moves along this fitness landscape, making these trade-offs, and you get to a peak. You get to a fitness peak. Now, it's not necessarily the highest point in the whole system, but you, you know, you've got to a peak, and one of the problems that you can have when you get to a peak is, in order to go up anywhere else, you're going to have to go down first. So I'm going to talk about peak fitness. Where would you say, so if this is the spectrum, right, of trade-offs, over here being like you make no trade-offs, you've made no adaptive moves, and over here you've made a lot of trade-offs, where do you think is the most healthy, fit organism on that scale? Anyone have a guess? Somewhere in the middle? That's a good guess. But here's what it looks like. So if, first, when you first make those first couple of trade-offs, you know, light bones and wings and so forth, you actually shoot up in fitness, right? Then there are a few more, after a few more trade-offs, you actually get pretty optimal. And then as you continue to move towards efficiency, as you continue to move towards this efficient organization, you, what happens is your fitness goes down. You know why? Because the landscape, the fitness landscape is not stable. Every time any organism makes a move on that landscape, it actually is changing the landscape. So these hills and valleys are not consistently, they're not like granite, they're not like rock. They're maybe a little bit more like sand and 
sometimes today I think they're moving more towards ocean waves that they move so quickly. So you have these trade-offs between, you know, what you could call perfect chaos, right, which is your startup organization, and perfect order, which is your highly evolved but optimized for one specific kind of a purpose organization. And in the middle is where you're going to optimize your fitness. So I think of these as being like hot, you think of a temperature range. So an organization that's running very hot on the chaotic side is going to be like a startup. You know, very, very high energy, um, maybe not profitable. You know, uh, running, you know, an organization that's running too hot is going to have, um, you know, is going to feel chaotic. It's going to be like, oh, you know what, we have a new idea every day, but we don't execute on them. And that's, that's, a star, that's, a, that's a hot organization. What's an example of a hot organization? Enron, right? Super hot. And what happened? You know, Goldman, another reason. No controls, Goldman Sachs. No controls. No, no, no real regulatory environment to speak of, right? That's not a good thing, right? You don't want your organization to run too hot. Or what's an organization that ran too cold? Yeah, thank you. I got it. Someone said it. Kodak, right? It ran too cold. We're so optimized. You know, they Kodak actually invented the digital camera in 1972. They predicted when using Moore's law, the te law of technology uh, advancement, they predicted when it would become a commercial technology, and yet every time it came up for review, who wants to look at their photos on a TV? Why would anyone ever want to do that? Because that's the clumsy first effort. That's what it looked like. It was a cassette tape machine duct taped to a camera, which you pulled out the cassette and you put it in another cassette and you watched it on the TV. That was how it, that was the, the Wright Brothers version of the digital camera, right? Okay, so you don't want to be Kodak. You don't want to be Enron, right? I, sometimes I call this the Goldilocks um, you know, thing because you don't want it too hot. You don't want your porridge too hot. You don't want it too cold. You want it to be just right, right in the middle. How do you know where your organization is? Where do you think, where would you say, I mean, whether it's healthcare or the Mayo Clinic, I mean, where do we feel like our organization is today? Is it too hot? Is it too cold? Is it just right? Dr. Wood, what do you think? We'd like to have it be simmering more than it is, probably. Yeah, it's, I would say probably a, a lot of us could agree that it's a little too cold for our liking, that it needs to warm up a little bit. Um, so I'm going to base my statements on the assumption that you agree with me there, that it needs to warm up a little bit. So again, we go back to these levers. We can, have, we can, we can kick variation up or down. We can kick the selection criteria up or down. Or we can kick interaction up and down. These are things we can do. So let's talk about variation. Um, Lou Gerstner, who is the CEO of, and the kind of the primary change agent, uh, turnaround agent for IBM, said, small organizations are more agile than large organizations. Therefore, break large organizations into the smallest pieces possible. So this is one thing you can do to increase variation in your system, is you can break the larger units into smaller units and you can increase their autonomy by reducing the degree to which they are dependent on other units to get their job done. You reduce those interdependencies. You know, give people more freedom and autonomy to do the things that they want to do. What's an example of this? Uh, this is a, I, I went, when I get sick, when I got sick, I looked for a doctor. I didn't have a doctor. I hadn't been to a doctor in years. And uh, I avoid you guys, whenever I can, as much as I can. <laughs> anyway, so I went on the internet, right, looking for a doctor. And here's this guy. He's got 144 reviews. He's got a 28 score, 28 out of possible 30. Extraordinary to perfection. So I'm like, this can't be real. This can't be a real doctor. I can't. I'm. Anyway, I went through all the reviews. I read them, and I thought, okay. I gotta go to this one. I gotta go find out. So what's the story of this place? It's Total Access Urgent Care. It's in St. Louis, where I live. That is Dr. 
Matt Bruckel. He is, um, basically, he was an emergency room doctor. Now, again, we're talking about increasing autonomy, right? He was actually very unhappy working in the emergency room. I talked to him about this. Why did you do this? How did this happen? He said, I, I hated working in the emergency room because the, the triage processes and the systems were such that by the time I ever got to anyone, they were always impatient, angry, frustrated, upset that they had been waiting in the emergency room for so long that, you know, I was just dealing with frowning people all day. And in fact, not only was I dealing with frowning people all day, I saw them coming. I'd be like, I, I'll get to you, I, I promise. And that was what my day looked like. And for him, this is a pursuit of happiness thing. I just wanted to be happy. I wanted to treat people. I didn't want to have them have to wait and suffer. And I didn't, for me, I was not happy dealing with people that were always upset and frustrated. So I basically started my own emergency room. <laughs> So he's got everything there. He's got a pharmacy in there. Uh, he's got a X-ray machine, you know, CAT scan, all those things, EM, whatever they are, all the acronyms. Um, so how's it different? He's he doesn't handle certain. It's low acuity, so it doesn't handle everything that emergency room handles. Um, but 80% of his patients are in and out within an hour, and I can testify to that. Um, and it's, it costs about a fifth of what it costs to run an emergency room, 20%. Um, and the customer satisfaction is off the charts, off the charts. Um, okay, so that's one way, right? You escape the system, you go out, you start your own thing, right? That's one way to do it. This is a, but this is a way to increase variety and increase the autonomy in the system. Um, the fact that he had to leave a hospital to make this happen in his life is kind of a sad thing. Yeah, so he was there, you know, is, and I don't have the answer to this, and maybe you don't either, but is there a way that that hospital could have kept him and kept that entrepreneurial spirit and had it happen within the, the environment of the hospital somehow? Okay, so this is increasing variation, right? You increase the number of agents. And they have more ability to move around within the system. And you can actually get on more peaks. Because you have more agents, more autonomy, they're going to actually fill up that landscape. And they're going to find more of those fitness peaks. So the whole system is going to be more fit. All right, so selection. Selection, you can, you can change it. Every time you change the selection criteria in the landscape, that's just really changing the landscape itself. So this is not something I'm going to talk about that you have a lot of control over today. but. This is happening, right? This landscape is changing. And what's happened is Obamacare is basically dramatically changing the landscape, right? It's my little animation. OK. It's getting flatter, right? Some of those, there's, there's more peaks, but there's, you know, there are probably smaller peaks, right? OK. Now the last one, interaction. So how do you increase interaction? You want more interaction happening on the landscape. You have to make it easier for people to connect with each other, make it easier for them to communicate, make it easier for them to cooperate. That means trust. You have to build trust within the system. And you have to make it easier for them to self-coordinate, not coordinate them, for them to coordinate themselves. Patients like me, raise your hand if you're familiar with patients like me. Okay, This is patients self-organizing to share data and information about their treatment, about their uh, everything that they're going through, their journaling and so forth. Um, I don't know how well you can see that, but there's all this data that they are self-collecting through journals and so forth about their treatments and what they think of their treatments. So how is it going to feel for you as a physician when the patient says, you know what, why are you giving me the bad this treatment? All the other patients like me <laughs> They like this other treatment. You know, how's that going to feel when the patients start asking those difficult questions? Because it is going to happen. It's going to happen more and more and more as these social networks become more ubiquitous. Um, this is this is a, this is about making it easier to connect, um, coordinate, cooperate, etc. Okay. So what does this mean? Raising the level of interaction. This is all about just getting that whole landscape moving faster, more motion more connections, more interactions, that's going to heat up the, your system. So this is happening. I mean, it's happening whether it's in your organization or outside your organization. This 
self-organizing stuff is going on. And I think the social networks and mobile devices are a big part of that. You know, wherever you are at any moment, you can actually click a button and kind of record your sentiment, your emotion, everything that's going into that moment. So how do you do this with intention? As, a, as someone who's in one of these systems, how do you intentionally go about doing this? I think this is a, something that I call co-design. I've heard some of the people in the Center for Innovation call it design with. Um, and this is, I, this is a self-organizing approach to design. This is an approach to design that is actually starting and initiating the process of self-organization by getting the people who are going to be a part of the thing to work together to start to design the thing. So what does co-design involve? So first, it involves getting a large and diverse group talking across the silos and across disciplines, getting there, just like you have today, to come here to hear me talk, get out of the day-to-day, -day, get your heads out of the um, you know, the day-to-day -day grind and make time, because I know nobody has time, so you have to make it, and the people who are going to make it are going to be designing the future. The people are going to make that time to get out of their day. Um, second, you have to study the system together. You have to look at it. You have to actually try and understand it. Why do we exhibit these behaviors? What is it that's driving this? What are the habits that we're in? What are the ruts that we're in? And then you have to visualize and model what those possible futures could be. So you, you want to have some idea of what the system, you, what it wants to be. Because every system wants to move in a direction. You want to help it, probably. And then you start tweaking the levers. So I want to leave you with this. The people who know how to make it better are already here. Okay? You are here. You're probably the leaders in this. We just need to make it easier for them to self-organize. We need to make it easier for them to do the stuff that they pretty much already know needs to be done. Easier to connect, communicate, coordinate, cooperate. I think that's it. Thank you. I'm sure I left a lot of unanswered questions, which is great. That's great. Well, thank you, Dave. You're um, giving us a lot to think about as we start the new year. So thanks again for coming today. Um, we actually had a number of our staff members submit some questions in advance. So we'd like to uh, do the warm-up here with a few of those questions. As Nick mentioned, then, we're going to go ahead and open up questions from the audience. We have a couple of people here, Teresa and Linda, that will be walking around with microphones. We ask that you raise your hand and you wait to ask the question until you have a microphone because Dave so graciously agreed that we could go ahead and record uh, this session. It's being webcast to our other sites. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, the first question, Dave, is not unlike many academic medical centers and these large complex organizations and healthcare and such, um, Mayo is divided into many departments and divisions has many formal structures and hierarchy. Is that an obstacle to becoming a more connected company? Is it limiting our effectiveness? And what should a 21st century org structure look like? Where do okay, we go so here? what do you all think? Is, uh, is being a hierarchy <laughs> and all these formal structures, is it limiting our effect effectiveness? Raise your hand. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, I don't think there's any question about it. Uh, and this is the thing that, that there's, you know, I think the whole industrial era has been about optimizing efficiency, uh, predictability, you know, uh, reliability, making sure that everything kind of is as consistent and predictable as possible. Um, but, I mean, are patients and illnesses consistent and predictable? I mean, if you're going to have, you know, a lot of hospitals, and I, I'm not putting necessarily want to paint the Mayo Clinic with this brush, but a lot of hospitals are designed kind of like factories where, you know, you have the input of the patient coming in and there's these kind of processes that the patient goes through and they're supposed to get better. But the thing about any factory and any factory person will tell you is you've got to have consistent inputs to get consistent outputs. But patients are not, are anything but consistent and predictable in terms of what they come in with. Mm -hmm. And so I think, in, you know, what, uh, what that 
means is that this kind of industrial factory model is not optimal for healthcare. That healthcare really needs to be thought of more like a service, which is more customized to the individual in there. I mean, there are things you can do with the service, but I would say to answer your question about what does a 21st century organization look like, um, I think it's a, uh, it's less about, it's less like a factory and it's more like a scaled up service. And what a, you know, scaled up service, who's, uh, you have Nordstrom's around here? Does anyone shop at Nordstrom? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, we, we wish. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, so Nordstrom is one of my favorite examples because, you know, what happens when you go there? You are taken care of. Um, you're, you, 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 uh, the, and the people who are in Nordstrom have been given a huge amount of freedom and autonomy to serve you and solve your problem. So they have, I mean, their, their employee manual is a, fits on an index card. It just says, uh, well, what does it say? It says something like, uh, Use your best judgment in all situations. There will be no other rules. Mm -hmm. If you have a question or a problem, talk to your supervisor. You know, if you have an issue. But basically, uh, you know, now I'm not saying that this is how we should run a hospital. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's not my, what I'm saying. But I, what I am saying is we need to move in that direction. We need, you know, we need to, if we're going to have people, think about the n amount of time and investment that goes into going into medical school and being trained as a physician or a nurse or a technician. We should be able to trust these people. I mean, we should be able to trust these people to make good judgment calls. And um, there's nothing wrong with checklists and so forth when you're trying to remember. You know, I have a gro I write down my grocery list, so when I go to the store, I don't forget things. I'm not against that. But we also need to, uh, I think, you know, remember that we have a lot of super smart, very experienced, very well-intentioned people. Mm -hmm. They probably don't need a lot of, you know, structure. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you are talking a lot about empowerment at the level closest to the customer, and sort mm -hmm. of understanding what the needs are of the customer. Yeah, and I think, well, the patient, the customer, yeah, I think that another thing is that, um, you know, a frustration that many people will share have, who've been through healthcare experiences is how many times do I have to fill out the same form? You know, that's one, right? Mm -hmm. Why do I have to fill out the same form? Why do I have to explain to the so for the third time to the next person, this thing that I mm -hmm. have just explained to three other people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, th there's, a, there's, a, there's a cult in the industrial age that's about rewarding individual performance. It's all about, you know, creating more competition and getting people to compete with each other. But I think that um, what we're going to see in this next century, we're going to see a lot more rewards that are focused on team performance. So, you know, what does it take to make a a patient better. It takes a team of people. It takes a, a group of people. Well, why should we, I mean, is it really more convenient? I mean, it might be more convenient for all the different specialists mm -hmm. to be, have the patient go around and wait to talk to each one of them, but wouldn't it really be more effective overall for everyone to get together and like, even if it's a little bit more inconvenient for all the practitioners mm -hmm. and a little bit less convenient for everybody, wouldn't it be great to get everyone together just around the table with the patient at the same time? Mm -hmm. Now, you may do that here. Mm -hmm. I haven't been here as that. a patient. Mm -hmm. But that's the direction that I think healthcare needs to be moving is it's going to be a little less convenient for a lot of the people in the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's, it needs to be more convenient and actually more effective. To make, make it more effective, it actually needs to be centered around the patient mm -hmm. more than it is. We've been talking a lot about, you know, how you move the center of gravity more to the person, to the patient, you know, mm -hmm. out into the community and around the clinic. So and I think that's a really, really important concept. Well, this Dr. Bruckel that I mm -hmm. talked about who started the uh, total access care thing, I mean, he didn't have 144 or whatever it was reviews because he wasn't asking for feedback. I mean, mm -hmm. He was asking people to, to go and, and give him a review, no matter what that was. Mm -hmm. You know, he wants the feedback. He wants to know how he's doing. He wants that patient satisfaction mm -hmm. uh, record. Mm -hmm. And you can see there, I mean, he's not a perfect 30. He was a 28. And I actually read all, all the reviews. Some of them were, there was a couple that were negative, And he actually was there addressing them and having the conversation with those people to make it better. That's fantastic. Uh, the next question, Dave, um, what do you see as the most important attributes and competencies of leaders in a truly connected company? I think of, uh, 
I'm, I'm not a big sports fan, but I think of football, American football and uh, basketball as being very different sports. So one of them is actually more about planning and control, and the other is more about agi enabling agility. And if you think about those sports, even if you're not a sports fan, in, in football, the coach can actually control a lot more of the game. The coach can actually, some of them will even radio to the quarterback the plays into the helmet from the sidelines. Because every play, you, the, the players line up roughly the same. You know, there's a whistle, the ball is dead, the players line up, you can call the play, and you kind of get a fresh start every time. And there's a, it's a highly, a lot of specialists, you know, there's people who just kick, right? I just kick. That's all I do. I'm a kicker. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And we have those, right? We have those in the healthcare system. Um, so that's football, right? And in football, the, the coach has a lot of control, can control the game because the game moves at a certain pace and because of the specialists and so forth. In basketball, you can't do that. In basketball, the player, every player at some point is going to be playing every position. At some point is going to be making a judgment call. A coach in a basketball team has to focus a lot more energy just on building the team, on supporting the team, building the team. I'll focus a lot more on the interactions that are intuitive between the players. A coach on a, a basketball team is much more of a, of a support role because they can't control the, the game when it's underway. And it's like an operating room, right? You, you know, you know the, the director of the medical facility cannot have control over what happens in the operating room. That has to be, ha the players who are on the field have to make that call. And I think even for the things that uh, maybe are slower moving in healthcare, that, you know, we're going to have to get more, um, if we want to get to a place where we're making more customized decisions for patients and a, a more customized care to very particular problems and issues, we're going to have to be uh, leaving more and more of those judgment calls to the physicians. Mm -hmm. Now, I realize there's lots of, you know, there's all kinds of risks and regulations involved here mm -hmm. that I am completely and happily unaware of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, directionally, I think yeah. that's the, the direction that we need to be moving. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, you brought up football, so Vikings or the Packers on Saturday? Oh, I can't. Right. No. <laughs> Packers. Um, um, so the next question is, and I think that you the definitely. Vikings, of course. I <laughs> you definitely hinted at this in the talk, Dave, but perhaps a little more perspective on it. What is your view of how employee performance should be managed, assessed, and rewarded? I talked a little bit about uh, the idea that teams, you know, the, that rewards should be more oriented towards teams and individuals. Um, but I also think that, uh, you know, who's the customer? I mean, I think that the ultimate um, judge of how good a job we're doing should be the patient or the patient's family, you know, mm -hmm. that, that, you know, and what, they, what do they care about, you know, getting better mm -hmm. health outcomes, mm -hmm. you know. So I think that if we can, and, and for them to see their health care uh, as a team sport, that they're a player on that team, and they can mm -hmm. see and they understand all the players on the team, and they feel like they're part of a mm -hmm. team, I think that's mm -hmm. huge. I think mm -hmm. that could be very powerful. Mm -hmm. That's great. I'm going to ask one more question. I actually have a few more, and then we'll open it up uh, for the audience. And what does a culture of innovation mean to you? <laughs> when you think about a culture of innovation, what do you think it should mean to Mayo Clinic? And, and how do you think about sort of building out a culture of innovation and how to measure such a thing? Well, you remember the chart I had about the peak fitness being in between the extremes, not being one extreme or another. I think you know, uh, you know, uh, the negative way to think of a culture of innovation is everything's got to be new. You know, everyone's got an idea. Every idea's got to be pursued, et cetera. I think that's, you know, that's sort of going too far in that the direction of innovation. I think, but I think in a in a very highly optimized organization, uh, like I would say this one probably is, and especially one that's going to be facing a lot of change that we probably can't even anticipate or, or figure out yet, and Probably people are going to be making less money. You know, some people might leave the system altogether. You know, lots of things are going to happen in the coming years. I think it comes down. What I believe a culture of innovation needs to look like here is, I think I said earlier, you got to make the time to get out of the day to day and cross those 
uh, boundaries with other disciplines to actually figure out, you know, what is it that we, what is it that we need to be talking about? What is it that this organization needs to be? You can't, um, you know, if you're just heads down doing your job every day, you're like the guy who's chopping the wood with the blunt axe. You know that story? It's like, why don't you sharpen your axe? I'm too busy chopping. <laughs> I don't have time to sharpen my axe. I think a culture of innovation, you got to make time to sharpen the axe. You got to actually take a day, uh, you know, get 50 people together, you know, from all across the organization, and uh, or a couple days, or a couple days, a day a month, or whatever it is, to to actually get out of that and have those conversations that are important but not urgent. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not the urgent things that's like on your hip buzzing you or dialing you, but there's nevertheless they're incredibly important. And I think a culture of innovation has to be making time for that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Very, very good. We're going to go on ahead and open up for questions from the audience. Again, Linda and Teresa have microphones. Just raise your hand. We'll get a microphone right to you. And if you uh, go ahead and share your question with the microphone, that would be great so we can all hear. And by the way, thank you all of you for taking the time to sharpen your axes today <laughs> and coming out to do this. Good, good. There we go. Uh, so not all variation is good, right? Right. Okay, so you didn't talk a whole lot about selection. Like in classic evolution, you vary, you vary the wrong way and you basically die. Mm -hmm. So what, what's the recommendation for the selection criteria and how do you implement in, that in an organization? Well, I think, you know, um, uh, Obamacare is introducing a whole host of selection criteria that, you know, is like usually in an, in an environment as a stakeholder in a complex system, you don't have a lot of control over the selection criteria, right? So what are the selection criteria that are facing you now? Well, um, as Dr. Wood said to me earlier, you know, the well is running dry. So we have only so many dollars that people are making in our, in our economic system, and we've pretty much maximized the amount of dollars that, out of that that can be going to health care. And with Obamacare kicking in, we've probably got even more money and that's got to come from somewhere and just going to come from taxes or deficit one or the other. And I think you said that Dr. Wood, the, the biggest driver of the deficit is health care or one of the biggest. So we're running out. I mean, that's a selection criteria, right? This we've sort of, we've, we've, we've exceeded the GDP or the, uh, the consumer price index. If you compare the cost of health care with the consumer price index, you know, we've hit us, we're hitting the ceiling. So I think, you know, we don't need to make up more selection criteria, is my opinion. We've, we've got enough of them kicking in. We're just not dealing with them yet. We're kind of like the federal government. We're, we're sort of spinning up a deficit, you know, that, that we're going to have to handle one way or another at, certain, at some point in time. Um, now, am I saying that doctors should just do whatever they think? I mean, we also have malpractice insurance. That's another kind of, you know, or malpractice suits is another kind of selection criteria, right? Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question or not. Um, it's complex. Well, you would just want it to control what variations you keep as long as you go away, right? That's right, yeah. You can do it based on cost. And you can do it based on cost. Um, I think, in, uh, so he said, just to repeat, um, you want to make sure that you have the ability to throw away the bad variations and keep and reinforce the good variations. Absolutely true. I think that one of the things that you can, so things that I think are good selection criteria I do think customer satisfaction and kind of return rates, not, returns to a hospital aren't necessarily good. <laughs> like if you're McDonald's, it's good if they come back. But, um, <laughs> but you know, so, or lack thereof, you know, so how, uh, how satisfied are people with the experience? Um, how, what is the cost relative to the outcome that you got? Um, I think that you, have, you do have some great selection criteria. I think that the challenge is, um, uh, if the selection criteria is too strong in terms of regulations or uh, committees and the organization is too cold, then what you've done is you've stifled innovation to the degree that people are like, oh, I mean, you, you know what, I know what's, how many times have you been in a, like talking to a civil servant or a large institution in any, of any kind where someone says to you, I know it's the right thing to do, I just can't do it. It's just mm -hmm. not, it's a policy thing, I'm not allowed even though I know it's the right thing to do. Now, that's an organization that's got a, a, is frozen. <laughs> you know, and I think that um, I believe you're actually 
not only in the Mayo Clinic but in Minnesota, I think you're actually much closer to the just right sweet spot than a lot of healthcare or the healthcare system. Um, but I think still, you know, the fact that you're all here and you're focused on innovation today to me is a really great thing. And I wouldn't have come, frankly, if I didn't believe that you're leading the charge here. Um, I just think it's, you know, like I say, I avoid healthcare. It's complex. It's pol political. There's all kinds of power and money involved. It's a very, very complex and difficult and intransigent system. And it's not an easy thing to try and say, let's change healthcare. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's terrifying. Um, but it's kind of exciting too. Mm -hmm. right? You know, it's exciting that there's uh, this conversation at least beginning. You know, happening. It's happening since 2009. So that's pretty exciting. Other questions? Um, I'm really intrigued by the idea of <clears throat> fragmenting, like taking a large organization you were saying about kind of making it, you know, basically deconstructing it mm -hmm. and thinking about, I mean, it's so radical to think about Mayo Clinic, which has been so centralized and you know, so much about kind of the integration and can you think of an example of a company that's gone from being very kind of large and centralized and kind of inward looking or, you know, just in terms of a, a single entity and become more of a distributed model or something that if, and has been successful? Yes, I can. Believe it or not, I have one. IBM uh, was actually they had their well had run, di run dry and about 2000, 2001, uh, they were running hugely in the red. Um, and what did they do? They brought in a customer to be the CEO. He was the CEO of American Express, which is a customer of IBM, really frustrated and angry with the fact that he couldn't be seen as a global customer. He could only be seen every different uh, regional department of IBM was, you know, sort of like a fiefdom. And they were all kind of, you know, run on their own P&L. So when he, he would have to go and, and introduce himself to every, kind of like that person filling out the form over and over, he had to do that with IBM. So he became CEO, and he basically uh, made a huge effort, and he actually had to fight some real wars with people who had territory that they didn't want to give up, political stuff. He had to take on the culture. The culture of the company was very inward focused. We are excellent. We are great. Uh, you know, he remember he, one of the stories he told was about um, how IBM withdrew all their support for one of his data centers because they put in one machine that wasn't an IBM machine. And he was like, how, ar how arrogant, how? And so when he became CEO, he's like, let's. You know, so he started looking at the customer satisfaction numbers, and he started saying, well, how come the customer satisfaction numbers are so high and the customers aren't coming back? And then he figured out, well, the way that the whole customer satisfaction system worked was you get to pick which customers you ask how satisfied they are. <laughs> well, of course, you're gonna, yeah. who are you going to ask, right? So he, had fi he found all kinds of sort of issues like this. Um, there was one guy who was in... Um, intercepting his emails through all of Europe and just he was only letting certain ones go through that the guy agreed with. <laughs> so that was another one. It's like I had to find that this guy is actually intercepting the email at some <laughs> node, you know. Um, there's another one who was a guy who had his, he was in, I think he was in Germany, there was a, a business unit leader who had his like special crew and their whole idea was they had to go from being regional to being uh, uh, more oriented towards lines of business like banking or finance, and they were sort of becoming more horizontal this way. So this one guy had his loyal crew. And whenever anyone would come in from the senior IBM people, he'd say, okay, you're now experts in tele, you're all telecommunications people, okay? <laughs> they, would, they would fake it, and they would just do whatever he said. So it wasn't an easy thing. I mean, he had to take on, um, I mean, he was, it was a major long-term initiative. He had, I think he said, if I didn't have to take on the culture at IBM, I wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. But it, for him, it was, he, he, he comes down to it's all about the culture. It's all about the culture. And the culture is, if the culture is territorial, you're not going to get that interaction across those peaks. So you're not going to get that movement and that 
that motion, that uh, simmering that you want, you're going to get, you know, you're going to get people hanging on to their their fiefdom. So you have to, you know, and you know when that when you start moving that direction, you know, there are going to be people who are not going to make that transition because they're not going to be willing to let go of their turf. Great one. Another question. Hi, David. Hi. <laughs> So uh, earlier we talked, I was sharing with you some Mayo Clinic stories and some CFI stories, and I talked a lot about how there's so many amazing things going on in these little departments, and since I sit in public affairs, I, I, I watch how we try to communicate these things, and, and you've written about connected companies and huge, vast connected companies. Do you have an example of an organization where employees connect and share stories to a very effective level where they're actually making changes because they're learning from each other and uh, how to optimize that kind of an environment. Well, you know, it's funny that you ask that because just yesterday I visited with uh, 3M up in uh, St. Paul. Now they have like people doing research. Uh, they have like a, um, I think it's a, a couple hundred different research labs where they have scientists doing experiments and working with different materials and how can we make a better sandpaper and all this all across, you know, um, these 200, this 200 uh, building research park. And they have science fairs. <laughs> they basically have like a, they get together in a big room and they have posters. Here's my research. Here's what I'm working on. And they go around and they're like, oh, you're working on this diamond stuff. And this guy's over here is working on this, um, film for, you know, maybe you could, if you got together, you could do some TV screens or something, you know, and so they, they, they actually have a, literally a science fair where they, you know, walk around and they look at each other's work and they present it and, um, you know, they make time for that. They make space and they make time and it's actually a, you know, it's, it's a ritual. They do it on a regular basis to make sure that that cross-pollination is happening. Great. I think we have time for one more question. Then again, Dave is very willing to stay until 1.30 for questions you might want to present to him up on the stage. So one more question. Please. Down here in front. Enjoyed your talks today. Uh, casting a broad net with this question because I feel you've kind of hinted toward it all along, but what is your one challenge for Mayo Clinic? Oh, wow. <laughs> Well, I, I think it's, I, I think the challenge is making the time and, you know, the space, literally. I mean, you, someone has to basically create, um, uh, someone has to make a space where this can happen, whether it's a social media space or a physical space, probably both. But someone has to make a space, um, you know, there's something that some of you may have heard of called open space, which is just a, a way of facilitating a meeting. And it's actually really could be very powerful for you guys, and I'll just describe it quickly for those who don't know. You basically build, you, you draw a big matrix on a wall, and on the vertical axis is 9 a.m., 10 a.m., 11 a.m., 12 a.m., you know, the, 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 the times of the day. And across the horizontal axis, you have different rooms. And so everyone convenes in a big room at the beginning of the day. And then anyone who has a topic that they want to talk about or share they fill up the matrix. They just put sticky notes up there and says, I want to talk, I'm going to talk about this topic in this room at this time. And so the group fills in the matrix and then people just go to the thing that they want to talk about. So it's a way of self-organizing a very large group into a, it's almost a self-organizing conference, if you will. It's a way of self-organizing a whole bunch of people by interest and passion. And what happens is those people go to those rooms and they connect around something that they have passion for and they care about, and suddenly you've self-organized, you know, 20 or 30 teams that are ready to drive something forward, and then they're going to start asking questions and looking for ways to do it. Mm -hmm. um, that's a powerful, powerful, um, just mechanism for uh, enabling a group, and it's you can read about it online, just like an open space technology, mm -hmm. they call it. Well, that sounds like a great tactic to apply, and we definitely want to be an even more connected company. So we thank everyone for coming. Happy New Year. Again, Dave's willing to stick around. Thank you.